Okay, um, working on these limit problems, one thing that you've got to do is you have to get memorized kind of a series of thoughts. And so as I go through this, I'll keep reminding you of those sequence of thoughts that you should be having, but you do need to get them memorized, otherwise you'll struggle forever on the limit problems. So when I look at this limit problem, first thing I notice is that x is not approaching infinity. Like that, if you're not remembering to do that, make a note. First thing I notice, x is not approaching infinity. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be doing an additive comparison, so I just stop thinking about it completely. Questions so far? The next thought, though, is, okay, factory. That always helps me solve limit problems. So that's what I'm going to do next. So it equals, and I'd rather pay other people tickets. Plus involvement really helps class. So somebody factor for me, Jeff. In two tickets, I'll probably stop saying two tickets, but make sure you always give yourself two. Any questions? Awesome. Uh, that's a memorized step as well. You have to just look at it and say, yep, that factors. Uh, and go from there. Any questions? Cool. Uh, next person, tell me what to do. Somebody knows. Okay. Um, the x over, or the x minus 2 and the x minus 2a um, equals 1. Nicely done. Three tickets for saying equal 1. So these divide to make 1. <laughs> these divide to make 1. Somebody tell me exactly what to write here. Like what remains once we divide to make 1? Great. Uh, we do 1 over x plus 2. Nicely done. Any question? Pretty good. Okay, um, so once we get to this point, uh, all that's left to do is remind yourself what it means to find a limit. So finding a limit means for a certain x coordinate, in this case 2, well not exactly 2, but close to 2, what will the y coordinate be? And the formula they give you is how you find the y coordinate. But we have a simpler version here, so that's what we use. So I'm just going to use this space over here to no, so we're not doing this. So I think to myself, okay, x, y. Um, now, everyone, what I'm doing here, you can do this in your head. You don't have to write it down. It's simply, if I do it in my head, it's a little harder for you to see. So this can be done mentally. You don't have to write it down. Uh, plug in a little bit less than 2. That means I'm going to get 1 all over. Okay, so that's going to be really close to 1 fourth. If I plug in more than two, uh, same result. Really close to one four. <coughs> Therefore, the overall limit is exactly one four. Any questions on that? Pretty good. Um, we'll get, which, look up which one this is there. 37, thank you. Thirty-seven. Um, I've actually never seen a question on the AP test that asked you to find the limit as x approaches negative infinity. But I threw it on just to kind of get you a little bit prepared in case they decide to do that. Um, here's what I would have done. Uh, let's see. Negative infinity, you can think of that as being a very small value, or you can think of it as being a very large negative value. If I think of it as a large negative value, this problem becomes very much like a problem where x is approaching positive infinity. I say, well, 2 times a very large negative added to 3 isn't going to make a whole lot of difference. The 3 is just not going to make much difference. So this problem can be rewritten like this. Limit as x approaches negative infinity of simply 2x over 3x. The x is divided to make 1, so no matter how large of a negative value we plug in here, the, um, it doesn't matter how big this negative value gets, the whole thing is going to approach 2 thirds. You know, feel free in class always. Anything I do that you sit and think to yourself, 
Well, it would be nice of you to say that again, just raise your hand, I'll say it again, and I'll try to always say it differently, just bring it in a different way, probably. So, so when it's a negative infinity, you just treat it as kind of the same as the negative. Very similar. I have to be a little careful with the negative, but very similar. What case would it, like, what would make it different? It happens, it can become a little different if you start squaring some of the x's and then dividing them. Um, you just have to watch to make sure you don't get a sign change occurring. Um, it's not, I don't think you should stress too much though. It'll be I can kind of do that just for a little extra pockets. For Sarah, good question. Pretty obvious. Um, okay, next one. Is Uh, 44 is a tricky problem, but I put it on to get you used to the AP test. Uh, okay, it's x approaching infinity. So I think to myself, additive comparisons. Now listen carefully to my next thought. Concentration level is perfect. Everybody give yourself two tickets. It's nice to guess. No, it's very good. Um, listen to my next thought, though. This is my next thought. I look here and I go, wait a minute. I expected to see e to the x because that's what I've been seeing in all the other problems. So I have a, I have a dilemma. What happens when x approaches infinity if this is e to the negative x? I'm not really sure. So I kind of pause for a second. But then I remember something that you're going to do all year long. And that's that I can rewrite this in a way that will make this problem easier to solve. Or at least I know this is a legal step. Um, whether it helps me or not, I'm not really sure. But I do know that it's legal. Uh, make sure you have this identity memorized. What I just did. Is there any questions about what I just did there? Cool. Um, now it helps. If x gets really, really large, I have memorized that e to the x gets very large. Okay, I also know that 1 divided by something really, really big is close to 0. It's 1 divided by something really, really large is close to 0. 10 times close to 0 will also be close to 0. Add 6, you're pretty close to 6. So this whole limit is going to get very close to 6 on the top, 2 on the bottom, which is equal to 3. Because this will do the same thing. When x gets close to infinity, this will get close to 0, times 5 will be close to 0. Bring, please. So they won't ever cancel out because they're the same thing. Like uh, in the beginning problem, the e to the negative x, they won't cancel out. Divide like this. Or equal to 1. Yeah. Uh, everyone listen, hey, 10 points for Braden Markham. He's asking a really good question, but everyone's got to see this. Uh, you can never do that. Like dividing these is never legal because the numerator is not factored. You can only divide when the numerator and denominator are both factored. Okay, fair? That's a good question. That one, that mistake happens so much, that's why I give you 10. So that's, I want to make sure we see it, we don't do it. So, sir. So when you think of 1 over 2, I only Yeah, I only flipped it because, like this one in number 43, I don't really need to flip this because I know that when x gets large, e to the x gets very large. The only reason I changed it to 1 over like so is because I couldn't remember what e to the, x, e to the negative x does as x gets large. So by changing it, I put it in a form that I recognize. I know what e to the x does. Make sure that helps you. So if that one um, would There you go. In 43, because e to the x is going to get very, very large, compared to 5, you stop noticing that you're adding 5. And so I can create a new limit problem that looks like this. Now I can divide these because the numerator and denominator are both factors. Um, that tells me the limit's going to be 3 over 2. Questioning is really good, sir. Don't stop. Is that helping at all? Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, 
We only use the additive comparisons if x is approaching infinity. Uh, you can do it with negative infinity as well, but like I said to Sarah, I think we should probably not worry about that too much. I've never actually seen an AP question where they ask that. Please. So uh, the difference is, I couldn't remember what either the negative x does as x approaches infinity. In 43, I remember um, e to the positive x will approach like a very large value as x gets bigger. So I can say a large value plus 5 is pretty much just the large value. So you don't always get to start out with the um, Not always, but most of the time that's what we're doing. Good question. Wait, so you said you like Exactly right, exactly right. So again, from the beginning, I said x is approaching infinity. So I've got two terms being added, so I thought to see if I can somehow get rid of one of them. But I could not remember what e to the negative x does. So I rewrote it like this. In this form, it's easier for me. I know this gets really, really big. 1 divided by really, really big is very close to 0. 0 times 10, pretty close to 0. Plus 6, pretty close to 7. Please. But now we know what the negative, uh, negative x does, and so can you just say, Absolutely. oh, the negative x does, and we do the 6 mm -hmm. Well, then Deborah, hey, <coughs> Deborah said, well, now we've kind of discussed it, she's just going to memorize that when x goes to infinity, this gets really close to 0. Totally valid. Totally valid. Um, Solving the limit problems is definitely a combination of a few logical things to memorize to try, like you know the additive comparison, factoring, uh, but also memorizing a few key facts about functions. Yeah, very good. Okay. Pretty else? Okay, cool. Next one. Good question. Really good. Uh, Brain, you good? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. infinity, I don't worry about the additive comparisons. Move on. Um, next thought, factoring. Uh, looks like a possibility, so I start writing. I'm looking for someone to help me. How do we factor? It's not hard. I just want you to talk. Chance. Factor out in the X. Two points for chance. Somebody can complete it. You're just sharing the, just sharing the wealth. So. Uh, somebody else. Deborah. Two more for Deborah and Chance. Any questions? Oh, please. Oh, no, no. Oh, keep going. Oh, please. And then on the body, you can back down. Thanks. Awesome. Perfect. Somebody else? Let's go right here. Let's see. Any questions? We're good. Perfect. Um, the x is divided to make 1. Any questions? Cool. Uh, now it becomes just a mental exercise. Listen carefully to the words. <coughs> I don't plug in exactly zero, but I mentally think, of what happens if I plug in something close? Well, close to zero squared is going to be still close to zero. And negative four is close to, so this is going to be close to zero. Uh, this will be close to zero. So six plus close to zero plus close to zero, pretty darn close to six. Uh, similar to the bottom, the answer is two. Um, two for Anderson. 
super Hannah. And then back to Deborah's comment. Um, yeah, you can do that every time, Hannah, if you want. If x is approaching 0, you can actually do an additive comparison for this type of a problem where they're all power functions. And just note that the lowest power becomes the most dominant. When x approaches 0, it works every time. Um, so either way is fine. What else? Please check. Um, so there's never a time where that would not work. Um, let me just earlier say, you said like it could potentially. Like yeah, let me just try and say this as carefully as I can. So as long as you have a polynomial, as long as x is approaching 0, uh, then it will always work. The reason I'm cautious is because I hate for them to throw in some little difference. Like if they throw in something like e to the x, you got to be more careful. Yeah. But it does work for this specific case very well. Okay. Yeah. Good question, Chad. Does that help a little? Yeah. Okay. I think why, yeah, anyway, we're good. Go. So like, work-wise on the HP test, would you get in trouble from doing it that way? Oh, great question. Three tickets for Kelsey. Um, on the AP test, for a problem like this, they honestly would give you full credit if you simply wrote down the answer. Yeah, I write out all the steps because we're just learning how to handle limits, and I don't want anyone to get mixed up. But for this type of a problem, you literally can just write down the answer, and they'll give you full credit. They would not expect you to show anything. Please. Can you do 61 real quick? Right here? Yeah. So same way, Aspen, uh, my factor. So the numerator can take out an x squared. <coughs> and the denominator can take out an x squared. Let's pause there. Um, does anyone have any question about the factor? This is the place I've seen people make mistakes. Everyone comfortable? Good aspect. These divide to make one. So now we have this limit problem. I think another reason, Chad, why I started out by explaining the factoring method versus the just compare them is because we use factoring so much, it is good to get a little practice. Yeah. But either way, it does work. Um, and now it becomes a mental exercise aspect. If I plug in something close to zero, this will get very close to zero. This will get very close to zero. Uh, I'm going to get very close to 12. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So on the first step, when you factor, because you can factor out a 3 as well, would you just want to leave the 3 in with that squared? Oh, good question. Um, either way, I didn't even notice. <coughs> yeah, you're more correct, Aspen, that a 3 does factor from the numerator. Um, but it didn't really matter either way. Okay. Good question. The key is this aspen. We're trying to factor so we can divide. And so, yeah, either way is fine. I can't see a big difference. So. What else? All right, next one. Perfect. 
Um, mental exercise. Try plug in something close to one, close to one, whether it's a little more than one or a little less than one, the denominator is going to be very close to two, therefore this limit is one half. Okay, it is crucial that you always remind yourself, you're not plugging in one, you're plugging in close to one. Okay? Don't ever think you're plugging in one. No. Awesome. Hand it up with this. Are you good? You're going to have on 84, you're going to have a large value 
but by much larger value, the <coughs> limit is going to be approaching zero. Eight. Perfect. Cool. Good talk and pass it out. Um, the first test, I don't ever schedule the date because I always want to kind of gauge how quickly you're picking things up. But it will occur probably about a third week in September. Okay, a couple of weeks. With all the packets for this unit are actually over here. We have the pink packet today. We'll put this up over two days. We've got the blue, yellow, and green. Those go a little bit. Last year, obviously, you get to the first test and you like October 2nd or 2nd. But you maybe get there a little bit later, just to save a little more time later. It's 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 a little more time later. May 9th is a very fixed date. It's a little more time later. 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 I have a bike I have a bike She was doing great the next month. I was like, 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 I was like,
when you see a function, and you're supposed to identify whether it has a hold, vertical asymptote, and or jump, it's very much like finding a limit. There's a series of mental questions that I kind of ask myself to, to identify whether it has a whole vertical asymptote or jump. So the first thing I note is this function is piecewise. It has, this is number 17, it has three different pieces to it. Okay, memorize this. Only piecewise functions have jumps. For our class, only is guaranteed. For our class, only piecewise functions have jumps. If it's not a piecewise function, it will not have a jump. So memorize that chapter. Is a jump like the graph that we saw where it would like have a, like where it go from one, I don't know how to explain it. Keep going, you're doing great. You're so doing like it have a line and then the dot, but then the dot above it was a hole. And then, is that like a jump? Perfect, Chad, okay. perfect. Um, the key idea is even simpler, Chad. Everyone watch, hey, super Chad. The idea is you have a graph. And a graph is a series of points. And the points are coming along like this, Chad. Yeah. And they're all like close to each other. So no jumps. Yeah. And then suddenly the next y coordinate is very far away. Okay. That's all that's really meant by a jump. Yeah. But you're right, on a graph they draw like this. It's okay. very good. It's very good. Yeah. So only piecewise have jumps. Okay, next thing. Also memorize. Also memorize that the jumps can only occur when you change from one part of the piecewise to another. <coughs> so a piecewise function is just a series of formulas that are used to find the y values. So there's this formula, this formula, and this one. And each of them are used to find y coordinates. According to the instructions, the first formula is used whenever the x coordinates are three or less. The next formula is used when the x coordinates are between 3 and 4. And the last formula is used when the x coordinates are greater than 4. So for example, I'm going to use this space over here, so I'm tossing this off. If you were making a table, and you plug in, say, I don't know, negative 10 for the x coordinate, the y coordinate would be found by using the very first formula. So you would be plugging x coordinates into the first formula to find the y coordinate. If you plug in, say, negative 2, same thing. If you plug in 0, same thing. You're still using the first formula to find the y coordinate. Somebody help me. When do you stop using the first formula? Oh, right. Still better, sir. Close. You actually stop using the first formula three for Sarah at exactly three. Because it says the first formula can be used for x values up to and including exactly three. So this one still uses the first formula. But then I think you and I were thinking the same thing, we're just kind of saying it differently. The very next x value, Sarah, which is what you said, just a tiny bit more than three. That x value no longer gets plugged into the first formula. It goes into the middle formula. Questions about piecewise functions. When this occurs, when you stop using the first formula and start using another formula, you could have a jump. I don't know yet because I haven't calculated any y coordinates, but I could have a jump. Any questions? Okay, this function can have a second jump. Uh, you can use the middle formula. I want somebody to raise their hand on this one. Uh, somebody raise your hand and tell me what's the very, like precisely, what is the very last x, in fact, everyone who knows, raise your hand. What is precisely the very last x coordinate that gets plugged into the middle formula as you're finding y values for this function? All who know, okay, everybody who raises their hand. All who know. The very last x coordinate for this piecewise function. So everyone give yourself two if your hand is raised, and a man at time. Perfect. All the way to exactly four uses the middle function, the middle formula. So that means the, um, 
next one would be just a little bit more than four is going to use the last one. So when you change from plugging x values into the middle to plugging x values in the last formula, another jump could occur. So this piecewise function could have zero jumps, one jump, or two jumps. Pause for questions. And so to find the jumps, you just would go to, you would just find the values. Nicely the done. Nicely done. Uh, we simply say, okay, when we plug in a three, let's see what happens. So we get three minus two divided by three squared minus three, two points for Landon. So this is going to be one divided by four. So when the x-coordinate is three, for this function, the y-coordinate is one, four. So we're okay with that. And then Landon said to see if there's a jump, we know that we need to just check the next formula. So let's see here. If I get a little more than three, squared minus nine, uh, that's going to be not exactly, but really close to zero. Okay, unless these two y coordinates are infinitesimally close to each other, so one fourth is not infinitesimally close to zero. That's a jump. And so you would note that on your work. This function has a jump at an x value of, you just say three. Pause for comments. So the instructions say we should look for any type of discontinuity. So kind of random, but we just started looking for jumps. Um, we need to check and see if there's another jump because there could be one between right there at four. Uh, but we still have to look for holes in vertical asymptotes. We just haven't got there yet. Question? Please, no. Absolutely. Um, so this one, Ellie, this piecewise function has three different parts. Therefore, it could have a maximum of two jumps. If there are only two parts to this piecewise function, maximum of one jump. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good question. Anybody else? Three for Ellie, that was very good. We need to check for the other jump. Um, so we just plug it in. Check four. That's going to be really close to 7. Well, that should be exact. I did that wrong. Hey, no crazy notes. Know, fix your notes. This should not be 4 plus. I should be putting exactly 4. I get exactly 7. For this one, I plug in close to 4. So that's 2 times close to 4 minus 10. <coughs> Oh, that's going to be very... Uh, you oh, yeah. can see it. No, you can see it. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. This is negative two. So there's a second jump at x equal four. Question. Please chat. Um, when you want to check for the jump, do you want to check at the value that's like closest to both of the equations, I guess? You have to check. Yeah. The way I always, you've got the right idea, Herb. Let me just say it back to you. Yeah. The way I always think of it, Chad, is as you look at a piecewise function, it's almost like looking at a table. This is how you find the y values. <laughs> like, so this column here is how you find the y values. Yeah. And then this column is what x's go with those y values. Mm -hmm. So as I read the piecewise function, I immediately identify that the last x that will use the top formula is x equal 3. Yeah. So I know to check there, because I know the very next x coordinate gets plugged in the middle formula. Mm -hmm. That's where the jump comes from. Yeah. Got you there? Yeah. That's very good. Please. So uh, <coughs> every time there's different like, formulas or whatever, you would do the one like right, four, right after every single one? Yes. Let me see. This is the words I choose to use. 
I pick the very last x. So the very last x that goes in the top formula, that's the x I tap so over here, 3. That's the very last x in order that goes in the top formula. And then oblique. I then choose the first x that goes in the middle formula. Did that make sense? To compare them. If the jump's going to occur, it's going to occur between the last x that went in the first formula and then the um, first x that goes in the middle formula. And then you choose the last x. Perfect, perfect. Then I choose the last x from the middle formula. So right there, the last x from the middle. And then I choose the first x for the last formula. Okay. So that makes sense. Yeah. Perfect. Please. Perfect, Heidi. It's how many jumps. It's the maximum number of jumps that you could have. So there's three. Excuse me. Three sections to this one. So most I could have at most two jumps. At most, I may have zero, but at most two. Then, no, very good, Maddie. Um, everyone, if you compute, sorry, losing my voice. <coughs> you compute one of the x coordinates, like say one four, and the very next x coordinate that you compute turns out to be like just a tiny bit more than one four, or maybe exactly one four, or a tiny bit less than one four. No jump. That was by the plus and the minus, like an infinitesimal amount, an infinitesimal amount. As far as we can tell, we can't even compute the difference. We can tell it's a little more, but we just don't even know how much more, then it's a joke. I mean, then it's not a joke, so then it's not a joke. Ellie, you can, how should I say, you can take comfort in the fact that they've never designed a problem because it's a little too ambiguous, where it isn't pretty obvious that there's a joke, so it's a good question. <coughs> What else? Nicely done. Um, okay, can I erase the board? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good? Yo. Okay, yo is good. Um, <laughs> yo. Okay. okay, next thing. We still need to look for the other two types of discontinuities. A whole and or vertical asymptote. Memorize this. Holes and vertical asymptotes only occur in rational functions. Memorize that. Holes and vertical asymptotes only occur in rational functions. Memorize that. Only rational. So holes, just let me catch the notes. So holes and vertical asymptotes only occur in rational functions. Um, what did you say at the jump point? Only in piecewise. Yeah, it really helps, Ellie, to kind of get this categorization, this kind of list of thoughts in your head and make it permanent so when you look at a problem like this, that's what you're thinking. So when I looked at problem 17, I'm thinking, okay, it's piecewise, could have a jump. So we went and checked for that. Uh, next thing I look at, the first part of the piecewise function in 17, the first part, oh, sorry. Only in rational functions. Only in rational functions. Question, Todd. What else? Yeah, please tell What's a rational function? Uh, really easy. It's a function that is a ratio. As far as I'm concerned, there's, there's a more technical definition headed, but we don't care about it. If it's a ratio, a fraction, then it could have a whole or a vertical asymptote, or both. Good question, two for Hannah and Todd. Any other questions? So there would be one in the next grade one. Nice done, Jeff. So the second part of this piecewise function, I don't even go looking or nor the third part. Because it's not it's not a fraction. So the second and third parts of number 17, I don't even worry about. They are not going to have a whole, they're not going to have a vertical asymptote. Because they're not rational. They're not a fraction. <coughs> Please go. Right. The piecewise is just all these different functions together, making one function. Very good. Please. Does rational mean it is a 
There's a more technical definition, but for our class, just think of it as a fraction. It's good enough. <laughs> the technical definition is just going to get in the way. You know what I mean? Like, there's no reason to know it for our class. So, in fact, honestly, Kelsey, like I took, um, so I, okay, to be an engineer, like I had to take a one, two, three, differential equations, oh, partial right. differential equations, oh. linear algebra, and then to be a math teacher, I had to go in and take like abstract algebra, like five other classes. In all of those classes, I never had to know the meaning of rational function. So, yeah, fraction is good enough. Does that make sense? Like they make you memorize it, I think, in secondary three or something, and that's the only place you ever needed this. Okay. Um, okay. Next thing. So, very clear that we only need to look for holes and vertical asymptotes if the function is rational. And as Ellie said, this part of the piecewise is rational. So, I'm going to look in that part. Of it. Okay, when looking for a hole or vertical asymptote, the very best thing to do, if at all possible, is factor again. So I said factoring shows up all the time in this class. So I'm going to factor this part of the rational function. Actually, somebody's going to factor the bottom for me just because I'm getting tired of talking. So x minus 2, x plus 1. There we go. Wow. One more time, Landon. What? Minus 2, x Thank minus 2, and then x plus 1. Perfect. Thank you. You would have a question on the factoring. Good news for this class. They don't really ask tough factoring questions. They just don't. Because the class, the class is calculus. So they're not trying to make the factoring get in the way. Okay, once it's factored, the first thing I look for is a factor in the denominator that has a matching factor in the numerator. So, so with the <coughs> would that be a hole? That's a hole. <coughs> so would that be x plus 2? I mean, would that be plus 2 or that would be x at x equal 2? All at x equal 2. So you have to memorize. The holes occur for values of x where the denominator and numerator both become 0. And then wouldn't the vertical asymptote be close to the same thing because it's any time the denominator becomes 0? Very good. The vertical asymptote occurs when the denominator, but not the numerator, becomes zero. So the definitions are quite similar. In both cases, the denominator is becoming zero at some x value. The only difference is for the whole, there's a matching occurrence in the numerator becoming zero, but not the denominator. Sorry. Okay, one more time. So whole occurs when the value of x causes both the numerator and denominator to become zero. Vertical asymptote occurs at a value of x, which only causes the denominator to become zero. So there would not be a vertical asymptote at, a, at x equals two; it would just be a hole. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, this one has a vertical asymptote at x equal negative one, but not a vertical asymptote at x equal two. That's why, Landon, the first thing I looked for was the hole, just to kind of prevent myself from thinking it's a vertical asymptote. Really good question. Follow-up question. <coughs> yeah. So let me go through the, the sequence again, sir. It's a good question. Uh, so you're okay that you only look if it's a rational function for a vertical asset or hold. You caught that factoring is very helpful. The key idea is a hole occurs at a value of x. So a hole will occur at a value of x. So I just watch when you're writing circles. Which is x. So a hole occurs at a value of x, which causes both the numerator and denominator to become zero at that you know x values. Take your time. You good? Okay. Vertical asymptote occurs at values of x, which cause only the denominator to become zero, not the numerator. Are you good? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so if you wouldn't be able to factor the fraction, would there be no holes? Not necessarily, it just makes it harder. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you can't factor the numerator and denominator, the numerator in this case was basically one factor. Yeah, if you can't factor, finding the hole can become difficult. I've never seen a question occur in our class where that happens. Oh, okay. So we kind of like out. They don't, they don't go that deep. So. Okay. 
Uh, sure. If the function turned out to be what Oakley said was, it's not this problem, but if the function turned out to be x plus 2 divided by x plus 1, I would simply note this function has a vertical asymptote at x equal negative 1, and that's it. Okay. There's, no, there's not a matching set of factors, so there's not going to be a whole, so yeah. just a vertical asymptote. So what if you were left with something on the top there? Would it matter? Let's, so let's, say like, let's say like, let's say like there was an x plus three by the x minus two on the top. Got it. Would that even matter? So Jeff's question is a different example. He's saying, what if we have a different function that turns out to be, uh, say one time, Jeff. So it'd be like x minus two, and then x minus x like x minus three. We'll say x plus three, and then x minus two, x plus one. So uh, this is very good. Three for Jeff. Hey, look up. Really good example, Jeff. Uh, first thing I do is I look for matching factors. That's what's going to cause the hole. So this function have a hole at x plus 2, x equal 2, sorry. I've taken care of the hole. Uh, there's still a term in the denominator that can become 0 at x equal negative 1. The extra term in the numerator causes what's called a zero, but not really talking about it today, so we're good. So okay. There we go. So would that just be like an x-intercept? Uh, x-axis intercept, that's a zero. Yeah, x-axis intercept and zero, same thing. Perfect. Perfect. There we go. Nice to done. Oh, please. So you have to like back to the whole, you can like clarify the whole Oh, great question. Hey, look at that. Free ticket. Look at me. Uh, you don't have to state specifically that on problem 17, that the hole and the vertical asymptote are a part of the first kind of portion of the function. You don't have to say that. But I would say, uh, in this class, it's super important. You're always thinking. You're never on autopilot. You never just like doing the work without thinking. Like, look at me. Just don't. Okay, they will fool you for sure. The only thing I would check here, Ellie, is I know, okay, wait a minute. This function has a hole at x equal 2. And, oh, that works because I can plug an x equal 2 into this formula. If I couldn't plug an x equal 2 into the formula, this function would not have a hole there because it's not part of the function. Question. Bell's going to ring. Good work. Cool. The board is 1 through 17 in the team. So we completed all of these. Through 17, we're completely done. 17, we're completely done. Or 17. Because you've identified these were other examples. But 17. The first thing you did.
Find the white house. Just go to home. Thank you. 